Listening test one. This is a practice listening test which resembles the international English language testing system listening test. The test consists of four sections. Answer the questions as you listen to the recording. Note that the recording is played once only. Please turn to section one. Section one. Ali and Ellis are overseas students studying in Australia. They are returning home for the summer holidays. Look at the example and questions one to four. For each of the questions, four pictures are given. Decide which picture is the best match with what you hear on the tape and circle the letter under that picture. First, you have some time to look more carefully at questions one to four. Now listen to the following conversations and answer questions one to four. That'll be thirteen dollars. Right. There's your change. Have a nice trip. Oh, I'll just get your bags out of the boot. Thank you very much, driver. Now, Ali, let's find the check-in desk. Yes, but with all the changes they've made here at the airport, I'm not sure where the check-in desk is. I know it's strange, isn't it? Why don't we ask for help? Good idea. What about that man sitting down over there? Which one? The one with the hat on? But what about the man with the blue uniform and the cap sitting on the trolley? He's bound to know. He looks like he works here. Okay, I'll ask him. Excuse me, could you tell me where the check-in desk for Alinka Airlines is, please? Oh, let me think. I haven't worked here very long. The best way to get there would be to turn left at the end here, where the duty-free shop is, and then go straight ahead until you're opposite the departure gates entrance. No, no, sorry.、Um, it might be quicker to turn right as soon as you get past the duty-free shop, and keep going along the corridor until you come to the sliding doors at the end. On the left, yeah, that's it. All the check-in counters are in a hall there. I'm pretty sure Air Linker is directly to your left as you walk in the hall. Thanks a lot. So it's left past the duty free, and then right opposite the coffee shop. You can't miss it. Come on then, Alice. We don't want to be late, and I want some time to get a cup of coffee and visit the duty free shop. Okay, Ali, but I want to go to the restroom first. I meet you at the check in desk. Ali now speaks to the clerk at the check in counter. Listen to the conversation and fill in the information on the excess baggage form in the spaces numbered five to thirteen. First, you have some time to look at the form. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions five to thirteen. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I would like to check in for flight AL eight one. Very good. Can I have your ticket and passport, please? Yes, here you are. Okay, thanks.、Uh, if you could just put your suitcase on the scales. Oh, I also have this extra box that I want to take as well. Okay, well that's extra luggage, so I'll have to get you to fill out an excess baggage declaration certificate. It'll cost extra, I'm afraid. Let's see, ninety、uh, dollars exactly. Oh well, what's the form for? It's just a form you have to fill out so that if there are any problems, we'll know where you are and how to contact you. So if you can give me a few details, I'll key in the information. Okay then. Now your passport says your name is Tam Pabalon. Is that right? Yes, Ali Tam Pabalon. Ali、uh, T A M P A B A L O N. Good. Now. Nationality Indonesian? No, wait a minute. It's a Malaysian passport. Well, yes, I live in Indonesia now, but I was born in Malaysia. Malaysian, very good. Flight number AL eight one. Destination is Jakarta. Are you connecting with any other flight in Jakarta, or will you be staying there? No, I'm spending my vacation in Jakarta. Well, Bogor, just outside Jakarta. Okay, so what's the phone number there? 
Um, let me think. The area code for Bogor is uh, 72, and the number is 881-453. Right, so that's 72-881-453. Yes, that's it. And can you tell me briefly what you have in the box? Well, there are some books, just university textbooks from last semester, some clothes, and, oh yeah, my computer disk. Okay, thank you. And what would be the approximate value of the contents? Oh, quite a bit, actually. About, yes, about $400. That's all. There's your receipt for the box, your passport and ticket, and here is your boarding pass, gate 7. You can board the plane in about 35 minutes. Have a nice flight. That is the end of section 1. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to section 1. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will now hear a short news item. Fill in the gaps in the summary of the news item with the correct word or phrase, according to what you hear. Place your answers to questions 14 to 21 in the column on the right of the page. The first one has been done for you as an example. You now have some time to look at the summary. Now listen to the news item and answer questions 14 to 21. The minister responsible declined to make any further statement. And now, with more information on the situation in Lidham, we cross to Sophie Roberts at the scene of today's major traffic accident. Good evening. Yes, Jana, the situation here in Avalon Road, Lidham, is chaotic. The death toll is rising with three known fatalities and a further 14 people receiving treatment at the local St. John's Hospital. A few moments ago, I spoke with the police rescue officer in charge, Commander McManus, who told me that it would be at least two hours before the northbound lane was reopened and even longer for the southbound lane that is still strewn with vehicles. He urged all drivers to find an alternative route through Lidham. Is there any clear indication as to what caused the disaster? Well, yes, Jana, they are starting to put together the accounts of the witnesses. Ah, here is Commander McManus. Commander, could you spare us a moment, please? Well, yes, just a moment, though. As you can see, I have a lot on right now. Yes, thank you. Now, tell me, do you have any more information for us? Yes, it seems from what I can piece together so far from the statements that the witnesses have made that the driver of the semi-trailer lost control of his vehicle as he came down the road there. As you are aware, it is a very steep stretch of highway. And it would have been very difficult for the driver to bring his vehicle back under control coming down that hill. There was a queue of traffic turning into Avalon Road from Batty Avenue. They wouldn't have been able to do anything. I'm sorry, I must get back to work. Yes, yes, of course, Commander. Thank you for your time. I also have with me Mr Pedro Navarra, a local shopkeeper, who told us that he heard the truck sounding its horn before the accident. Well, I was just unloading my truck outside the shop here, and I heard this horn, you know, just like an ordinary car horn. And it just went on and on, getting louder and louder, and then I think I was still holding a box of tomatoes, and there was this huge truck coming down the road, horn going and the lights on, traveling real fast. I don't know, maybe about 80 or 90 kilometers, it came straight down through the lights, right at the moment the traffic was turning into the highway, you know, Avalon Road from Batty Avenue, it just seemed to pick up the cars as it, as it went along. I tell you, it was a real mess. Thank you, Mr. Navarra, and so back to you, Jana, in the studio. Thank you, Sophie. Anyone wanting further information regarding those injured in the accident should ring St. John's Hospital, which has set up a hotline. And the number is Sydney 332-1778. I'll repeat that number, Sydney 332-1778. And now, 
With all the news of sport, here is Charles Oakton. That is the end of Section 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to Section 2. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. Next, you will hear an interview on the radio. Write a word or a short phrase to answer each of the questions numbered 22 to 33. First, you have some time to look at the example and questions. Now listen to the interview and answer questions 22 to 33. Good afternoon and welcome to Working Lives. My name is Sue Holt. This week we continue our series by looking at a job that is often thought of as adventurous, exotic and highly desirable. We're going to take a behind the scenes look at the airline hospitality industry. What is the reality behind the smart uniform and ever-ready smile of the flight attendant? We're lucky enough to have in the studio Julie Nevard, who works for Australian Airways and is a senior member of the cabin cruise staff. Thank you for finding the time to speak to us. I know that you must have a busy schedule. My pleasure. Yes, it is a very full-time job, but I think you realise that very early on in your career. How long have you been involved in in-flight hospitality? Well, I trained for a year at the Australian Airways Training School and I'd already taken an Associate Diploma in Hospitality and Tourism at TAFE after I left school. That's the Technical and Further Education College? Yeah, that's right. So all in all about five years. No, more like six years. So your training was at TAFE? Well, yes, the preliminary training. But then the Australian Airways Training Course in Darwin was a more specialised hospitality course. I suppose you could call the TAFE Associate Diploma my major professional qualification. I see. Now, tell me, is the job as glamorous as most people believe? Absolutely not. Of course, there are many good things about the job. You know, you never know where you might be going. For example, I still get excited when I see the new roster for the first time. Knowing I'll soon be off somewhere I haven't been before, on a new route. The best thing, of course, is that all the time I'm meeting new people. But people don't realise that what I get to see most of is the inside of hotel rooms. And most hotel rooms are pretty similar. Also, it's like I'm working, but the majority of my passengers are on holiday. Sometimes it's hard to deal with all their demands. There are times you just want to shout, I'm doing my best. I've got a job to do. Leave me alone. But that doesn't happen very often. Then tell me, what is your main responsibility during a flight? That's hard to say, really. Well, we're responsible for all the needs and demands of each and every passenger for up to 10 hours on some long-haul flights, not to mention the safety of the plane and all the passengers. I suppose if I have to come up with a single answer, it'd be passenger comfort. Do you find yourself going to the same places often? There are four or five major destinations that we fly to more regularly than others. Yes, I've got to know some cities very well. Oh, really? Which destinations are those? Well, there's London, Hong Kong, Bali, LAX. That's in New York? Los Angeles. These are the most frequent destinations with Australian Airways. So with all that travel, how do you deal with the constant changing of time zones? It's something you just have to get used to. Oh, everybody in the industry has a special tip to beat jet lag. But me? I just make sure that I'm regularly changing the time on my watch. I find that if I change the time little by little and fairly frequently, well, that seems to work well for me. You see, I have two watches, the one I'm constantly adjusting and the one with the original time at departure. That sounds like a good idea. So, have you seen many changes in the type of services you offer? Oh, yes. These days, the competition is much tougher. I suppose the result is that the consumer, the traveller, has a much better deal. 
Well, the seats are bigger, more comfortable than they were 10 years ago. The in-flight entertainment, the films. Now they're all recent release blockbusters. They weren't 10 years ago. But the two biggest improvements have been to do with the smoking restrictions and the upgrading of the meals. All oh, right. Tell me about these two changes. Yes. The restriction on smoking on some routes and the banning of smoking on others has had a twofold benefit. Firstly, the atmosphere is much more pleasant. And secondly, the fire risk is greatly reduced. You know, we used to have people dropping cigarettes, burning seats, dreadful fire risk. Can you imagine? Terrible. I, for one, never understood why anyone was ever allowed to smoke on aeroplanes in the first place. Um, and the meals? Ah. With so many carriers vying for passengers on the same route, you just have to offer more. Vegetarian meals, choice of two hot meals, interesting exotic gourmet food. All this is now commonplace in our economy class galleys. And for the business and first class passengers, the food is as good as in any world class restaurant. Top chefs, great presentation, nutritious ingredients, really quite lovely. And finally, what advice or words of warning would you give to school leavers considering a career in this industry? That's a difficult question. Let me think. I'd say think long and hard about why you want to do it. It's not all glamorous and it can be very hard work. It affects your family and your social life. I mean, I don't have any social life to speak of, unless it's with my colleagues at the airline. But all the same, it remains a rewarding and challenging career. You certainly never get bored. Julie, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you for your time. And just before we go, next week we will be talking to you. That is the end of Section 3. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to Section 3. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear part of an introductory seminar given at a hotel management school. Choose the most suitable of the answers given for each of the questions numbered 34 to 42. First, you have some time to look at the example and questions. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 34 to 42. Welcome to the first seminar of the International Hotel Hospitality and Management course. I hope that you enjoyed the uh, official welcome ceremony this morning and of course the very fine food for lunch provided by our second year students. Right, so my name's Garth Walters and I'm one of the career advisors at the school and uh, this afternoon, I intend to give you an overview of the four core subject options available to you in this course, one of which you will need to choose as your core or main subject by the end of the first week. Each core subject prepares students for work in one of four major career areas, front desk and reception work, drink and bar service, restaurant service, and lastly, guest relations. For each area that I have mentioned, we will explore the personal skills required, the professional qualifications needed, and the career opportunities available. To start with, we are going to take a look at front desk and reception work. In some ways, the reception desk is both the, uh, the face and the nerve centre of a hotel. It's the first point of physical contact with the client, and a close and professional relationship should be immediately struck up. The psychology behind the need for creating a good first impression and maintaining it is fairly obvious, but how to do this effectively constitutes a major slice of the work that all students will be doing in the first few weeks of this course, regardless of the option that you choose. Now the type of person who is best suited for front desk and reception work is self-confident, 
caring and sensitive, intelligent, and also able to work calmly in the glare of the public eye when it's as busy as it often gets, without appearing to panic. The ability to speak more than one language is, naturally, a great asset in this job, as is clear diction and familiarity with switchboard operating systems, a technical skill that is taught only in the front desk and reception core option. Qualifications? Well, ideally, an associate diploma with at least one foreign language would be good, but this is not strictly necessary. You are encouraged, however, to take up another language. As for the career opportunities available, um, after a few years, competent front desk staff can begin working in reception management, that is, being responsible for the VIP guests and coordinating and arranging conferences and meetings at the hotel. We now move on to the second core subject option, drink and bar service. Usually you need to have completed a recognised bar course to begin serving drinks in a top hotel, but you'll all be taught the basics since a percentage of the work in each option is compulsory for all students. Obviously, an outgoing and lively personality are prerequisites for this type of work. Also, an ability to work late into the night. So if you're a morning person, this type of work is definitely not for you. There is much more to skilled bar work than just serving drinks. It involves an intimate knowledge of most alcoholic beverages, mixers, wines and beers, as well as mixing techniques and the correct choice of drinks to accompany meals. An effective member of a drink and bar service team can eventually move into more specialised areas. Two of the main avenues open are cellar management, dealing exclusively with wine and fortified wines, the selection, purchase, storage and general upkeep of the hotel cellar. And the other area is working in coordination with fine restaurants as a wine manager or consultant, with the emphasis placed more on the bonding of wine with food. Naturally, for both careers, a wide and thorough knowledge and appreciation of wine varieties and styles is essential. The third course subject option is restaurant service. Well, a love of food and its presentation is a must for anyone considering this line of work. Also, life in a restaurant can be hectic, hot and very busy. The hours are long and the competition for certain positions within the industry is tough. But by completing the International Hotel Hospitality and Management Catering Corps option, you will be able to enter restaurant service as an assistant or grade three chef. As a grade three chef, you will be responsible for the preparation of salads and desserts, stocking and cleaning the fridges, etc. And as you learn, you can progress to grade two, and then, with time, grade one or chief chef. As you become more familiar with different styles of food and presentation, you may wish to specialize in a particular area. But as I said, the competition especially in the larger, more reputable hotels, can be fierce. Right, um, before I move on to the last option, guest relations, I want to say a few words about how you can best choose your core subject. But uh, are there any questions before I continue? That is the end of Section 4. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to Section 4. You now have one minute to check your answers for the entire test.
That is the end of the listening test. You are now given exactly ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening test answer sheet. Listening test two. This is a practice listening test which resembles the international English language testing system listening test. The test consists of four sections. Answer the questions as you listen to the recording. Note that the recording is played once only. Please turn to section one. Section one. Ava is an overseas student who was just enrolled at the National Business College. Her friend John meets her on enrolment day. Look at the example and questions one and two. For both questions, four pictures are given. Decide which picture is the best match with what you hear on the tape, and circle the letter under that picture. First. You have some time to look more carefully at questions one and two. Now listen to the conversation between Ava and John, and answer questions one and two. Hi, Ava. I see you've just enrolled. Oh, hi, John. Yes, it didn't take long. What about you? Oh, because I've re-enrolled for another year, I don't have to be here until this afternoon. But I thought I'd come along and help. Oh, that's very kind of you, John. Maybe you could help me with this elective class timetable. It's for students who need more English practice, like me. Yeah, it's a good idea. It's on Fridays, and I have to choose which timetable is best for me. There are four to choose from. Here, take a look. Oh, I see. Well, what do you need? I need everything, but especially writing practice. Well, do you want to go to the writing skills class in the morning or the afternoon? In the afternoon, I think. Okay. So, grammar and writing skills in the afternoon. Grammar? Oh no, I don't want to start the grammar. Well, in that case, reading and writing in the morning, followed by pronunciation. Then listening and speaking in the afternoon. I don't think my pronunciation is too bad. Do you? No, no, you speak very clearly. Yes, but I do need more vocabulary. If you study vocabulary in the morning, you have to study grammar in the afternoon. What about listening? Oh yes, I certainly need to practice more listening. Then your best choice would be to study listening and vocabulary in the afternoon, and writing, reading, and grammar in the morning. Do I have to take grammar? Well, if you want to improve your writing. Yes, I suppose you are right. And、hmm, writing class first lesson in the morning. I'm afraid so. How's your reading, Ava? Oh, I'm a bit slow. Yes, I think I will study writing, reading, and grammar in the morning. And listening and vocabulary in the afternoon. Good choice. Now, what do you have to do? Ah,、oh, just give this form to my tutor tomorrow. Do you have any classes today? There's a special introductory English class for foreign students later this morning. All right.、Uh, it's five past nine now. What time's the class? We have to be at the function room at 11 a.m. We've got time, so why don't I take you down to the student centre? Okay, but it's actually 9:30. Come on then. John and Ava continue their conversation in the student centre. Choose the most suitable of the answers given for each of the questions numbered three to seven. 
First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions three to seven. John, how many years have you been studying at the college? This is my second year. I started, um, well, one year ago. Tell me again, what is it that you're studying? Computing, isn't it? Basic programming? Yes, I worked as a computer programmer after I graduated from university. So why are you doing basic programming? No, no. Advanced programming. Right. Well, here we are at the student center. Oh, it's huge. Yeah, well, it has to be. There are 500 students on campus and 50 staff. Oh, look. There are some information about clubs. I'm already a member of the table tennis club and the scuba diving club. Do you want to play table tennis? I'm not much good, I'm afraid. What else is there? Surfing, tennis, hang gliding. What about scuba diving? How much is it to join? For second-year students, it's cheaper, only $10. But for first-year students, it's $20, I think. Do you want to become a member? I joined last year. Why not? Okay, well, let's go to the student information office. Uh, over here. At the student information office, Ava wants to join the scuba diving club. She has to give information about herself to the clerk. Listen to the conversation and complete the information on the club registration form in the spaces numbered 8 to 14. First, you have some time to look at the form. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 8 to 14. Hello. My friend Ava is a new student and she would like to join the scuba diving club? No problem. All I have to do is fill in this registration form and the cost is only $15 for first-year students. To start with, I need your full name. Ava, isn't it? Yes. E-W-A. Family name? Zaleska. Zaleska. How do you spell that? Z A L E S K A. Zaleska. Very good. And you're from Poland. Nationality Polish. I went to Poland last year. Great place. Okay. So what's your student number? Uh, on your student card. All oh, right. Here it is. Three four nine six eight AP. Three four nine six eight AP. Got it. You must be doing the advanced programming course. Tell me about your scuba diving experience. How long have you been diving? Two years. You're probably better than I am. Next thing is, do you know your blood type um, for safety reasons? All oh, right. Yes, it is A positive. And we always dive with a partner. Are you two going to dive together? Sure, why not? Okay, so what's your name? John. J O N. Family name? Anderberg. A. N, D, E, R, B, U, R, G. Good. When would you like to go diving? Is Sunday morning good for you, Ava? Not really, John. I go to church. We have sessions in the afternoon, too. Only on weekends, though. Oh, well. Saturday afternoon. Is that okay for you? Sure. Saturday p.m. One more thing. I need a contact number if we need to ring you change in the weather or something like that. Uh, what's your home telephone number? 565-2489. 565-2489. Now, all you have to do is pay the $15 and I'll fix you up with a club membership card. Here's an information sheet about the club. See you later. Bye. Hey, Ava, we've still got plenty of time. Let's watch some TV. All right. That is the end of section one. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to section one. Now turn to section two. 
Section 2. In the student centre, Ava watches a news item on television. Fill in the gaps in the summary of the news item with the correct word or phrase according to what you hear. Place your answers to questions 15 to 23 in the column on the right of the page. The first one has been done for you as an example. You now have some time to look at the summary. Now listen to the news item and answer questions 15 to 23. The police are continuing their investigations and based on new leads expect to make an early arrest. The drought in northern New South Wales continues to worsen with tens of thousands of hectares of once lush pastoral land having now been without a single drop of rain for over 13 months. Farmers from the stricken region are beginning to despair with meteorologists predicting that the drought is unlikely to break before Christmas. Many farmers have begun shooting their worst affected cattle, and in some cases, entire flocks of sheep have been destroyed. These measures, tough and cruel though they may seem, are essential to prevent a possible outbreak of widespread disease. It is not only farm animals that are in trouble. Environmentalists are also concerned that the lack of water in rivers, lakes and streams will mean many more native animals in the bush will die unless rain comes soon. They believe the drought could have a lasting effect on the populations of such native animals as kangaroos, wallabies and koalas. Our reporter Melanie Backhouse is in Moree, talking with long-range weather forecaster Benny Wilcox. Over to you, Melanie. Benny, can you give any indication as to when we might receive some rain in the affected regions of New South Wales? Well, it's hard to say, of course, but I'm confident that the drought will break within approximately three months. If you look back at the data kept of previous periods of drought over the last hundred years or so, you see a cyclic pattern of severity developing, and we are now at the short end of the last cycle. I'm fairly certain that we'll see some rain either just before or just after Christmas. Let's hope so. Thank you, Benny. Melanie Backhouse from the very hot and dry town of Moree in northern New South Wales. Meanwhile, at the CSIRO laboratories in Sydney, encouraging developments have recently been made in the process of cloud seeding, a process by which clouds can be forced to make rain, and research scientists are to begin conducting trials of a new technique involving lasers later this month. If successful, the state government will be asked to contribute up to $3 million to establish permanent cloud seeding stations in areas most likely to be affected by drought in the future. For many farmers, though, any breakthrough will have come too late. Every week more farming families are being forced to sell their homes, unable to survive financially with little or no income to support them. A special assistance fund has been set up to help drought-stricken families. If you'd like to send some money, you can do so by calling this number now, 008 65 4713. I'll repeat that number, 008 65 4713. Moscow. Talks today between the Russian delegation and the Vice President of the United States appear to have been successful. That is the end of Section 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to section 2. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. Later that morning, Ava attends a special class for students who are non-native speakers. The tutor is interviewing an ex-student of the college. For questions 24 to 32, listen to the interview and complete the sentences with a suitable word or phrase. First, you have some time to look at the example and questions.
Now listen to the interview and answer questions 24 to 32. Today I have with me Anna Cherney, who is a student at this college. Uh, how long ago? I was here uh, one and a half, no, two years ago now. Anna was a student in this English class when she was at the college, and she is here to tell us about the many problems facing a non-native speaker in an Australian tertiary institution. What have you been doing since you graduated, Anna? I was quite lucky when I left the college because I got a job pretty quickly with the local council. I'm still with them. Tell the class what course you took here at the college. Yes, I originally wanted to work in advertising, but I found it was too hard because of my English. And so I changed my direction. And, well, I'm glad I did because I've now got an associate diploma in nutritional science. And that's how I managed to get a job with the council. What exactly do you do with the council? I work with the chief dietitian, making sure that the meals prepared for the Meals on Wheels program are nutritionally balanced. Meals on Wheels provides food for the older people in the community who can't get out of their flat or their house. It's a very demanding job, but I like it. You deliver the food? No, no. I spend most of my day in a laboratory at the council, but sometimes I talk to older people to find out if the food is tasty enough and um, that they like it. I spend a lot of time in the kitchens, too, making sure that the food is good quality. What exactly were the problems when you first arrived at the college? I was very shy, you know. I couldn't communicate with the students in my class because most of them were Australian. My English was not very good. But I, th I thought everything was okay until I got the result of my first examination. The tutor was worried why I was so quiet in class. I told her it was because I was afraid to ask a question, and anyway, she suggested that I talk to the school counsellor. What advice did the counsellor give? Well, she was very kind and understanding, and I realised that I was doing the wrong course. You have to be an extrovert, you know, outgoing. I think it's a personal thing with me. You had to give a lot of opinions, and I am shy. So she suggested I ask more questions in class. So I made it a rule to ask at least one or two questions every lesson. So you swapped courses and began to talk more in class. Was there anything else that the counsellor suggested? Yes. She said I shouldn't live with students from my own country. I should share a house with some Australian students, so I did. And my English improved much faster. Are there any problems that you currently have with English? Oh, yes. I used to have problems with the technical vocabulary in my field, but you picked that up pretty quickly. Now it's mostly I have difficulty trying to understand the colloquial language of Australians. The way they express themselves is sometimes very strange. I see. How do you increase your vocabulary, for instance? I listen to the radio a lot, interviews on radio, talkback programs, that sort of thing. I find that really helps me. It's better than just watching TV. And actually, I keep a journal of the expressions I hear. Some people collect stamps, and I collect new words and English expressions. Let's talk some more about your course at the college. Do you remember any study projects that you were involved in? Uh, let me see. Well, there was one study we made of the nutritional habits of Australian schoolchildren. We had to produce a questionnaire for a group of 20 kids, and we discovered that too many children either didn't have any breakfast at all, or else they ate foods for breakfast that were much too high in sugar. These are two major dietary problems. Why? It's complicated, but breakfast is an important meal because your metabolic rate, the rate at which the body burns up food, is faster the earlier you begin eating in the day. So, if you want to have lots of energy, eat a good balanced breakfast. You need a higher metabolic rate, you see? 
<laughs> also, too much sugar in the diet can cause the blood sugar level to rise very quickly at first and then drop too rapidly. For breakfast, this is bad because later you are more likely to feel sleepy and unable to concentrate. So, eat a good breakfast. You'll think better, concentrate better, and yes, you'll probably score better in your exams. And one last question. What about your future? Have you any immediate plans? Well, in the short term, I'll continue to work for the council and gain more experience there. I hope to get a position in a hospital, which would be much more challenging than my present job. After that, my long-term goal is I have a dream to open my own business, an agency providing nutritional advice and giving consultations, or I might have to go back to my own country instead and do what I can to improve the diet of my people at home. Modern influences are causing great changes to the traditional diet. I see. Now, does anyone have any questions for Anna? Yes, in the first row. That is the end of Section 3. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to Section 3. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear part of the orientation in which Ava is shown the college's computer laboratory. For each of the questions numbered 33 to 42, circle the letter A if the statement is accurate, I if the statement is inaccurate, or N if the information in the statement is not given in the listening passage. First, you have some time to look at the example and questions. Now listen to the computer laboratory orientation and answer questions 33 to 42. Let me introduce you to Donald McLubbin, who's in charge of maintaining the facilities of our computer laboratory. And uh, over to you, Don. Yes, Norman. Well, as you can see, we have well over 100 PC computers, as well as 20 Macintosh computers, set up for those students who need to produce high-quality graphic design work. Of course, Maintenance of all these machines and the equipment that goes with them, printers, fax machines, modems, etc., takes up almost all of my time, so we have a number of rules. All students are expected to follow the rules, or they will be unable to use the lab in the future, and just about everybody needs to use the lab at some stage. First of all, log on procedure. All students have to log on, that is, enter their name and lab number before the program menu comes up on the screen. The reason is that if anything goes wrong with the machine, we can find out from you what it was you were doing when the problem occurred, and this can save a great deal of time when trying to solve the problem. Which brings us to the second rule. If something goes wrong, you mustn't just walk away from the computer or turn it off and pretend it hasn't happened. You must let me, or one of my assistants, know what has happened, and remember, we can always find out who was last using the machine. So with these two simple rules, it becomes relatively easy to maintain so many machines. The third rule concerns the use of student disks. At no time are you allowed to bring your own disks into the laboratory. This lab is completely free of the need for student disks of any kind, because each computer is linked to a network. And there are four networks, each of which has its own file-serving machine. We don't want you to bring along your own disks for two very good reasons. 
The first reason is because of copyright laws. It's illegal to copy programs bought by the college. The second reason has to do with those nasty little programs called viruses, which can do a tremendous amount of damage. So no student discs in the lab. We therefore insist that you leave your bags outside too, which is rule number four. Now, a network simply means a number of computers are linked together. In other words, can share information. There are three networks for the PC computers and one network for the 20 Macintosh machines. That brings me to the fifth rule. Students must only access the network that is set up for their use. One of the three PC networks is only for first-year students to use, over here. Another is only for second-year students, over there along the back wall. And the third network, on the far right, is reserved for third-year student use. The Macintosh computer network is reserved for second- and third-year students only, unless you are a first-year student of the graphic design course. Rule 5, you can only access the network that is set up for your level. All networks have printout capability, and there is a charge of 40 cents per page on the laser printers. The dot matrix printers, which of course do not give such good quality prints outs as the laser printers, are suitable mainly for giving a rough copy of your work. Uh, um, they are free for student use during class hours. After hours, a charge of 10 cents a page applies. Now, class hours, as you probably already know, are from 9 in the morning until 3.30 in the afternoon, Monday to Thursday, and until midday on Fridays. The computer lab, however, is open an hour before class begins each day, and until 6 o'clock every afternoon, except for Fridays, when the lab closes at 5. Now, if you need any assistance with the software program you're working on, you can either look in the manuals located on the shelves below each machine, or if you're still having problems, you can ask one of the lab assistants to help out. In addition, there is always help at hand on screen, in most cases simply by pressing function key number one at the top left of each keyboard. Well, that's about it. Oh, oh I forgot to mention the computer lab card, which contains your logon number. By producing your card, you can borrow computer books and manuals from the computer lab library. Um, OK, that's all I need to tell you at this stage. Back to you, Norman. Thanks, Don. Right, uh, next on the right, we come to the audiovisual laboratory. That is the end of Section 4. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to Section 4. You now have one minute to check your answers for the entire test. That is the end of the listening test. You are now given exactly 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening test answer sheet.